today, I have the honor, uh, we have the honor of listening to uh, Cecilia Bagnoli's dad, Joe Bagnoli. Um, a lot of you, uh, his daughters, I say Cecilia because Cecilia worked at Mayflower. And I know a lot of you live at Mayflower and maybe knew Cecilia. Um, so I just thought that would be kind of a different way of introducing Joe today. So Joe, great to see you. Joe is the Vice President of Enrollment and Dean of Admission and Financial Aid. I thought it'd be really great to give an update as to what it's like to apply for college. I mean, as someone who actually is now my second senior, my youngest child, um, it's a really different uh, process than when I went through it, um, which was only a short few years ago. But um, I think it's, I know it's changed watching them apply. Um, and I just think it's amazing Joe, what you and your department do. Uh, we have a phenomenal institution. We have, a f we have amazing students at Grinnell College. And I think it'd be really, I always am fascinated with who's here, how do you guys get them to come here, what that process is like. Um, so I wanted to share all the good that you do. So uh, please help me welcome Joe Bagnoli. Thank you, thank you, Sarah. It's really a pleasure to be here with all of you. I just spoke with Cecilia last night. She's out in Oregon working in a fellowship program, an AmeriCorps fellowship program, and really enjoying it. So uh, she misses all of you who she knew at the Mayflower and others in Grinnell. Uh, she was the youngest of four that came to Grinnell with me back in 2012 when uh, we... Uh, we first arrived in Grinnell, and I'll tell you more about that a little later this morning, but what I really thought about when Sarah introduced the idea of joining you for a bucket course was what a privilege it would be to look back on how things have gone and how we got to where we are and who are our students today, because most of the time as an enrollment manager, I spend my time looking forward. I spend my time thinking about the next batch of students and I know my friend Nancy Malley who for years ahead of me worked on that next batch of students knows what it looks like to always be looking forward so today gave me the opportunity to look in the rearview mirror a little bit and to think about the distance that we have traveled over the last number of years together here at Grinnell and I'm thrilled to see my old friend Jack Moody here who worked on a committee of the admission and student financial aid group, a uh, faculty representative, and to see a number of other familiar faces, Shane and others um, who are here with us this morning. So I think what we'll do is take 10 slides before our break, and then I'll, uh, then I'll introduce you to the way I introduce Grinnell to the world outside or beyond uh, the state of Iowa where the overwhelming majority of our students are coming from when they get to Grinnell. Before I do that though, I'll, in looking back, provide you with a quick snapshot of how things looked in the fall of, of 2011. This is the year that my daughter, Liliana, the oldest of the four, enrolled at Grinnell College. Uh, and I went back and looked at the, the number of students who were applying for admission back in 2011, we had 2,969 applications. And for the class that just arrived in August this year, we received 9,758 applications. So a significant difference in the volume of students who are raising their hand today and saying, I hope Grinnell will consider the possibility of admitting me uh, when we look at, at the difference in the domestic student application volume, which has grown by a little more than 100% from to about 2,000 to over 4,000 applications, um, that seems significant until you see the increase in the international student application volume, which is quite substantial from about 900 to over 5,000 applications that we received this year, a record number of applications coming to us from other countries. And in fact, this year, for the first time, the number of international students applying for admission at Grinnell exceeded the number of domestic students applying for admission to Grinnell. So Grinnell is clearly becoming uh, better understood, better known, and potentially more desirable uh, worldwide. 
And when you look at the number of spaces we have for students, they really haven't changed all that much over the last several years. The enrolled headcount shows you, I wonder if I have a little, oh, I do. Okay, so you can see that uh, we actually have 10 fewer enrolling students this year than we had in, in 2011. That, the target number of, of enrolling students, the number of seats we have available for entering students every year has really not changed all that much uh, in this period of time. But because of the increase in the application volume, the percentage of students being offered admission has gone from about 45% to, for the last few years, under 15%. Uh, to be in a position where you're admitting a smaller percentage of, a, of, of applying students puts you in what we would call a highly selective college category. And that has uh, blessings and curses all of its own. Um, it seems to motivate uh, an increasing number of students to consider the possibility of applying. Uh, and it makes it more complicated for us because we have to read a lot more applications. And, and we have to say no far more often than we used to say no uh, when students would apply for admission. Uh, so there's both advantage in that for us and disadvantage. Part of the advantage is that the tougher it is to get in, the more qualified the students who seem to apply. <laughs> Um, and certainly we have seen uh, that qualification in standardized terms. One way of looking at it is, what is the average test score of the students who are enrolling? The average test score. We, we use both ACT and SAT tests. Anybody remember taking an ACT or an SAT? Okay, sure. So uh, we convert ACT scores over to SAT scores in order to get what we would call a high test average. And back in 2011, the high test average was 1,330 um, out of a possible 1,600 points available on the SAT. And this year, uh, it was about where it's been for the last few years, 1,490. Now, I have to qualify that difference in, in some ways by saying that we became test optional in 2020 during the pandemic because test centers closed and it would have been impossible uh, to to enroll a class if we had maintained a, requ a test requirement. And then in subsequent conversations, the college decided that we should retain our test optional admission policy, at least for now. So this represents about half of the students who are arriving. The other half decided not to submit a test score in conjunction with their application for admission. Another important factor for Grinnell, given our commitments, is to diversity and access. And when one way that that commitment manifests is in the percentage of students who would identify as U.S. students of color. And back in 2011, that was just a little below 26 percent, and this year, above um, just above 29 percent, rounds down to 29 percent. And when you look at the composition of the entering classes in comparison in 2011 and 2024, what you see is that the clear majority of students, nearly two-thirds of arriving students identified as white U.S. citizens in 2011. And, and that percentage of international domestic students of color and dual citizens, anybody who is not identifying as a U.S. white student, represented 36% of the class. Demographic trends have changed all across the country in these period of years that are reflected here. And today, we have, for the third year in a row, what we call a multicultural majority of students, meaning that more than half of our students identify as either international students, U.S. students of color, or dual citizens. And this, uh, quite frankly, is uh, an outgrowth of the college's commitments, three fundamental commitments to number one, excellence, academic excellence, uh, and the role that diversity plays in curating uh, an academically excellent experience for students. Number two, a commitment to a diverse community. And number three, social responsibility as expressed in a wide variety of ways, not the least of which is meeting 100% of every student's demonstrated financial need, which is not something that most institutions have the luxury of doing, but Grinnell has been doing that since um, the early 1980s at least, 
uh, when Grinnell adopted a need blind admission policy and agreed that we would um, provide enough financial aid that any student offered admission would find Grinnell, enrollment at Grinnell attainable. So that's a snapshot of where we are today compared to where we were in 2011. This sort of mystery that Sarah began this uh, course talking about is tied up in between the years 2011 and 2024. And what I'm going to try and do in the span of time we have available today is talk about some of the critical changes that have occurred from that time to this time that seem to explain a lot of what you see in terms of uh, the student profile today in comparison. So I hope that's agreeable to you. If it's not, um, I have the microphone, so. <laughs> All right, um, some of the critical events. On arrival at Grinnell, uh, I met some tremendous institutional partners, uh, among them Monica Chavez Silva, who uh, was at the time working largely in community engagement. Nearly all of you would know Monica uh, personally, I think. And uh, one of the first exercises that we engaged together was this question of how to build town-gown relationships. How do we recognize that the success of the town of Grinnell and the success of the College of, the Grinnell, of Grinnell um, are inextricably connected? And we started a series of meetings with uh, the, the chamber president at the time. Uh, some of you will remember Angela, who served as the chamber chair, just chamber president for a number of years. We talked with Russ Behrens, who remains as city manager. And we talked about the relationship between the town and the college. And as importantly, we were trying to unpack the experience of prospective students when they arrived in Grinnell for a visit to Grinnell College. And we wanted to try and understand what were the impressions we were leaving with them and how might we positively influence those impressions in a way that would result in a higher percentage of visiting students electing to apply for admission to the college. And so among the things that we did was we got in a van and we took a road trip um, and the reason why the road trip became necessary was because our partners and friends here in the city of Grinnell seemed very focused on what I might call the Pella scenario. They were convinced that Grinnell was better than Pella. And I didn't really want to deliberate or debate that point because... Almost no one who was coming to visit Grinnell College was visiting Pella, Iowa, where Central is, of course, located. Uh, and it became necessary to look with diverse set of eyes on this problem, this question of how students were experiencing Grinnell and the impressions they were gaining of Grinnell. So we went to Pella just to see what it would be like in case a student might happen to go to Pella to visit. But we also went over to Northfield and visited Carleton. We went over to visit St. Olaf. We went up and visited McAllister. And then we flew out to the East Coast and we went and visited uh, Williams. And we went up and visited Dartmouth. And we were over at Middlebury and we visited Middlebury trying to reach conclusions about what we might do differently at Grinnell. And I will tell you that I came back from that trip feeling a little overwhelmed and a little discouraged. Uh, if you've ever visited those campuses, you might, uh, you might have come away with a very favorable impression of, of the, the, the campus proper. I remember standing on the back of Carlton's campus, if any of you have been there, looking over the ponds that have the little bridges over top of the ponds. Up on the hill is the spire. It just looked like a quintessential college campus. And I thought to myself, I'm not sure we're, we're going to win the campus beauty contest against these places. Um, but our board of trustees was, was rather convinced that we had the Taj Mahal of college campuses. And after the investments that they had made in the physical plant here at Grinnell, I couldn't really um, 
render an argument that they found very convincing. But I told them that our interest should be in trying to understand the impressions of 17-year-olds. And with all due respect, their impressions were about 50 years later than that. Um, and so it would be critical for us if we were trying to impact the decisions of young people, we should probably focus on their impressions rather than our board's impressions. And that meant that we were going to have to do a lot of research, which we've done, and I'll share some of that with you in a few minutes. But that was the start of uh, a new way of looking at an old set of challenges and questions. Part of the challenge for us was about where we are located. We are a little out of the way. I don't know if you noticed that or you ever experienced that, but um, you have to really mean to get here if you're going to visit Grinnell. Most people aren't just passing by and decide, oh, let's stop since we're in the area, um, which is an advantage that it turns out a lot of our competitors have. That's certainly not one of our advantages. 2014 rolls around, and in 2014, we partner with a group out of Atlanta, Georgia, Crane Meta Marketing. Uh, and part of uh, the reason for partnership was we wanted to understand ourselves better through the, the eyes of a third party. Um, and we wanted to understand what institutional distinctions might uh, be relevant to prospective students that we weren't necessarily apprehending on our own. And among the things that we, we learned a lot from that relationship, but um, one of the things we learned was a hard lesson. And that was their observation that the most distinctive thing about Cornell is our location. The most dis distinctive thing is our location. After all, there are a number of laudable national liberal arts colleges in the U.S., so being a liberal arts college doesn't make us distinctive. Being small doesn't make us distinctive. Being residential doesn't make us distinctive. Having 20 the 25 academic majors we had at the time doesn't make us distinctive. What really makes you distinctive, they said, was where you're located. So you should own it, which we attempted to do. And after fully implementing what it looked like to own our location, which meant changing all of our publications to prairie-style colors, wheat fields, uh, featuring students who were in the environment, making metaphorical references to our place in the prairie, making all of those changes and fully implementing them led to the only year in 10 when we lost 20% of our application pool turns out that sometimes what makes you distinctive doesn't necessarily make you compelling, at least not to 17-year-olds. Now, I always like to say when I get to here, I love living in Iowa. I happen to love it here, but I'm not 17 either, and I'm not um, thinking about it through the eyes of a college-bound student. So um, what we learned there, and I'll show you some of the data that's more current than the data we had at that time, was that we had a formidable challenge in overcoming perceptions of Iowa on the part of people who were from outside of Iowa. One of the other things that happened when we were visiting those college campuses is that um, we recognized that we didn't know where to start if we were going to try and up our game, so to speak, and create a campus environment and a campus experience that would compare more favorably to these other places where the very students who were applying for admission to Grinnell were also visiting. So we contacted a fellow by the name of Jeff Calais. And at the time, the Chronicle of Higher Education was referring to Jeff as the guru of the campus visit. Um, and that was true because he had visited over 600 different colleges and the drill was this. He would come in, he would take a tour, he would meet with your staff, he would download his impressions with you, and then upon further reflection after he left campus, send you a report on what his findings were. And that report, of course, came complete with a series of recommendations. Well, one of the recommendations that he made was that we should reconsider the location of the admission office. 
my first response to him was, thanks a lot, because the Board of Trustees had just 10 years earlier built the John Crystal Center, or at least a, approved of the building of the John Crystal Center, where our office was. But as Jeff would attest, it was not the most favorable orientation to campus for students. And he felt strongly that we needed to do a little better. In fact, I, I wish I could forget it, but I'm afraid I'll never be able to forget. And I'm, I'm looking right now at the John Crystal Center out behind, behind you there. Um, I remember anxiously a awaiting his completion of the campus tour. And at that time, Grinnell's comprehensive fee for tuition fees, room and board was $52,000 a year. A pretty significant sum of money. And I waited for him to finish the tour. He came back, it was a little after five o'clock in the afternoon. And he said, well, he says, it's been a long day. He had flown in. It's been a long day. I've got a lot to think about. I'll see you in the morning. And I was like, wait, 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 wait. You can't leave that quickly. I'd really love to hear your initial reactions. Like, you know, what's your gut reaction here? I was looking for good news. I didn't get it. He paused and reflectively said to me, well, Joe, it doesn't feel like it should cost as much as $52,000 a year. Ooh, that was a kicker. That was a little painful. And part of the impression that he had was the result of the experience that so many of our students were having in the John Crystal Center. At the time, you needed to find your way up to the second floor of the John Crystal Center. And I can't tell you the number of times we saw students and their families looking around for the second floor where the admission office was. It's hard to sign that building. It's all glass. Uh, so, you know, they were a little disoriented by the time they get there. And after they would get up to the second floor, we would say, oh, we're so glad to see you. You're late for the information session, which is in the basement. And so they'd get to the information session, uh, a room nicely appointed, but without windows. It was a little dark. We called it the garden level. Uh, wasn't really necessarily the best impression of the campus, where we kept them for longer than they really wanted to be, because after all, they came to look at the campus rather than to just look at four walls in the basement of a room. So in any case, Jeff went away and he developed a transcript that he could use to grade Grinnell's admission space um, based on his frame of reference at all the other institutions that he had visited. So he identified all sorts of things that should be evaluated and then he gave us grades. We put that in the form of a transcript and he gave us a cumulative GPA for the space that we were occupying. Anybody want to guess on a 4-0 scale what grade we earned? What GPA we earned? Shane, you're so close. 1.77. We did get an A on restrooms and on parking. Not unimportant features, but probably not worth $52,000 a year. Um, we didn't do so well on other areas. So that started a conversation with the Board of Trustees about the possibility of moving two blocks north. And it just so happened that at the time, our Center for Careers, Life, and Service, an emerging institutional distinction for us, our Center for Careers, Life, and Service was occupying parts of four different buildings. They needed a home where all of them could be in the same space. They got the John Crystal Center. We got a new admission student financial services building on the corner of 8th and Park, and it has been a real game changer for us. And I think partly explains some of the movement that you've seen here. Um, there was a very disruptive act of the National Association for College Admission Counselors when the Department of Justice, prior to the pandemic, decided that Colleges should not be able to share lists with one another of the students they were admitting in the early decision round of admission. Now, Sarah talks about the mystery of admission. Early decision is one of them. Early decision requires a binding commitment on the part of an applicant that if they apply early decision and the college admits them in early decision, they will cancel their applications everywhere else and enroll in the school to which they've applied early decision. And in order to safeguard early decision, 
colleges across the country, like Grinnell, shared lists with each other of the students that they had approved for admission. So that if a student didn't honor their agreement, um, the institution would withdraw their offer of admission. Uh, and the Department of Justice decided that that looked a little too much like, um, what's that called? It begins with a C. Um, boy, figure's not going to come to me right at the moment. I passed 50 and this starts to happen to me. Uh, <laughs> you don't know what I'm talking about, do you? Uh, <laughs> In any way, that kind of uh, corroborative activity was uh, offensive to antitrust legislation. And they decided that colleges could no longer share lists. And it was at that point when Grinnell realized that we might be able to take advantage of this exogenous factor, this thing that was being imposed on colleges, and use it for our advantage. And the way we did that was by creating what we called the Grinnell Choice Scholarship. The Grinnell Choice Scholarship offered the guarantee, which was not allowed by the National Association of College Admission Counselors prior to this. It guaranteed that any student admitted through an early decision application round would be awarded a minimum of a $20,000 Grinnell Choice Scholarship. And the way I talk to families about that is that the board asked me, how can we be the most invested, as far as financial aid is concerned, in the students who are the most invested in coming to Grinnell? And I said, well, the students who are clearly the most invested in coming to Grinnell are the students who apply in early decision. It requires a binding application. And they're already coming. And they said, well, what would it look like for us to give all of them a scholarship? I said, well, it would look very generous and highly unusual. Nobody does that. Uh, and they responded in kind by saying, oh, good, let's do that, which is what we did. And the consequence was critical for us. It drove an important increase in early application activity for Grinnell that we had tried for years to stimulate and couldn't quite get there. But the addition of that Grinnell Choice Scholarship led to a substantial increase in the share of students applying early for admission to Grinnell. And because so many were applying early, in early decision, and we were admitting them, it drove our admit rate down. And you see, you saw the difference between the admit rate in 2011 and the admission rate, the share of students who apply that we admit. Um, in 2024. So that was a critical moment in time for us, a critical event. And then, of course, came this little nasty pandemic. And that imposed some real challenge, not just, of course, on, on Grinnell College, on many institutions and many families and individuals. And what we recognized was that as painful as it would be for us institutionally, it was going to be equally, if not more painful, for the families of the students who were enrolled and who might be applying for admission. And so we made some decisions out of institutional values that were costly to Grinnell, and I think the right decisions to make. The first of those decisions was we decided to award every enrolled student a COVID-19 response grant, which essentially dialed back any increase whatsoever in the cost of tuition fees, room, and board. To my knowledge, that hasn't been done in recent years at, at Cornell, but we did that recognizing there would be a substantial cost involved. We also agreed to allow any student who wanted to stop out, who wanted to take a leave of absence, we agreed to grant it to every student who requested it. And we agreed to allow any newly admitted student who didn't want to start in the middle of the pandemic to take a gap year. And that was consequential for us. There were other institutions that will not be named that decided against that kind of generous response to their students. Why? Because it would have meant a negative consequence to their, uh, their retention, their graduation rates, and ultimately their college ranking in some of the uh, popular college rankings. Um, it's not all that long ago that I learned that one very highly ranked National Liberal Arts College told their students at the time, you can leave, but you'll have to apply for your seat if you want to come back. 
we would never have done that uh, at Cornell. But it cost us. It cost us in retention. It cost us in college rankings. It, it had some cost financially because we had far fewer students enrolled as a consequence of it. But the other thing that it led us to that I think was ultimately uh, important was a no loan policy in the financial aid area. It was very clear that the kind of financial commitments we were prepared to make would be most meaningful to families if they could quickly understand the investment the college was choosing to make in them. And almost nothing says generous financial aid quicker than we will not package your financial aid with a loan, a student loan. And so we adopted the no loan policy among need blind colleges that meet 100% of demonstrated financial need. Grinnell is one of only 12 that offers no loan financial aid packaging, which, mean dis- which meant essentially we were going to take loans out of the financial aid package and replace them with grants. So that required another, it was a $5 million annual commitment that the college made to the no loan program and we have it still today. And then, of course, last year, the Supreme Court decided to upend 40-plus years of precedent in the use of affirmative action in college admission and declared that no college, private or public, was any longer going to be afforded legal protections for the use of race as a factor among many other things in the admission of students. Now, Grinnell and our peers had used race as one of many factors in the admission process to ensure a diverse student body for 40-plus years. So this was highly disruptive. And in fact, many of the things I've just shared with you, you might think of as disruptive, exogenous factors that threaten the success of the college recruitment and admission process. But at each of these turns... I, I will say I have had tremendous pride in Grinnell College because at each of these turns, the college has taken a courageous step and in some ways taken advantage of what some might refer to as market disruption. While others are worried about what's going to happen, we've been thinking about how do we take advantage of this new moment. And that's exactly what we did when we found out that the Supreme Court was going to hear the cases against Harvard and the University of North Carolina of the Students for Fair Admission, rather than spending all of our time fighting what seemed like an inevitable Supreme Court decision, we spent our time thinking about how do we live and work and focus on our commitments in the wake of such a decision. And we put together... Uh, a variety of initiatives that I think will serve the college well over time. People have often asked me, you know, what's the recipe? How do you get to 10,000 applications? There are a fair number of enrollment managers that would like to know that, the answer to that. Um, And how do you do that from Grinnell, Iowa? And I would say that the most succinct response that I have for you about that recipe are what I call the three R's. When we represent the college to prospective students and those who influence them, we want to make sure that what we share, what we promote, is real. It would make little sense for us, for example, to advertise a nursing program. Why? We don't offer nursing, okay? I mean, that's a pretty simple example, but the point is that if what students encounter on arrival is not what we told them we had to offer for them in whatever form that might take, you can see that that, that's not sustainable. That wouldn't last, especially not with the megaphone that is social media today. People don't, students don't ask for our permission to tell the rest of the world what they think of us, right? Uh, So we have to be authentic with what we share and what we claim about institutional distinctions. We have to be real. And what it is we share has to seem relevant to them. It can't just be what we hope they will find compelling or appealing. 
it needs to be, if we're going to increase our visibility and the draw of students from across the world, they need to find it relevant at 17 years of age, which is when they're paying the most attention to the range of colleges they might choose from, which is a little scary, by the way. <laughs> uh, how would you like for your living to depend on the choices of 17-year-olds? Uh, you know, the frontal lobe isn't fully developed just yet, we know from neuroscience. But uh, the point is that if they're not excited about what you're talking about, even if it's authentic, it doesn't result in the kind of enrollment activity you hope. It doesn't Either it won't result in an application for admission, or if you offer them admission, won't necessarily result in a deposit saying, hey, count me in, I'm coming to Grinnell. So it must be relevant and and because of the challenge of our location, and by the way, apart from uh, a lesser known place by the name of Harvard, maybe, almost every college has a structural impediment of some sort. Ours just happens to be our location, and I'll show you the data that reflect that. But in order for a college to overcome the impediments to enrollment, it can't just be real and relevant, if our location in our case is our impediment, it has to be exciting enough of a proposition, a distinctive enough opportunity that students would choose it in spite of their leading objection to enrollment, which for many, as I'll show you, is our location. And what we came to recognize is we need to know more about what this generation of students finds compelling. And so we definitely studied that and we continue to revisit studies every year. And for the data minded th of those among you, you'll be impressed by a 50% response rate this year. And we ask students every year this year, we ask admitted students who were both enrolling and who had been admitted but decided not to enroll, a number of questions about their impressions of Grinnell. And I'm going to share with you the results of some of those. Now, that we asked them a lot more questions than, I'm, than I have time to share with you today because we need to take a break in a few minutes here. But we asked, uh, and by the way, I should, tell, I should qualify this by telling you that we work with a, a survey company that also surveys uh, students who've been admitted at a lot of our selective college peers so that we can make some comparisons of the impressions they have of Grinnell and the impressions they have of other selective places. And when other places ask, what factors caused your original top choice college to move down your list of preferences, they said, I just don't think I can afford it. Cost. Given the increasing costs associated with higher education, a number of the students who responded to that survey at our selective college peers said cost was the big thing that dropped my interest. Less so academics, a uh, little bit more often fit, and we'll unpack fit in a minute, but that's what we learned when we looked at the survey data from all of our selective peers. Grinnell asked the question, why didn't you take us more seriously? We just wanted to get to the point. Why didn't you take us more seriously? Cost was nowhere near what it is at other institutions, probably because we have very generous and competitive financial aid at Grinnell. It was more often academics. Now you might say, doesn't Grinnell have a tremendous academic reputation? You bet. Grinnell has a tremendous academic reputation, but it's all relative. If you've been admitted at Williams or Bowdoin or Amherst or Pomona or Harvard, or the University of Chicago, maybe you don't think that Grinnell is superior academically to those places, perhaps. So it's all relative. But then what's really important here is that when we ask, why didn't you take us more seriously? They said it was fit almost 100% of the time, or almost 100% of the students responding who said they weren't going to attend Grinnell told us it was about fit. Of course, you know what our next question was, right? What is fit? Yeah. Location, location, location. 
over 80% said, it's just not the right fit for me. The location is not the right fit for me. And so then we went on to ask the question, uh, what is it about our location that's not the right fit for you? And what did we learn? I don't like the idea of living in Iowa. 80% of them. And then I don't like the idea of living in a small town. And then I don't like the idea of living in the Midwest. And I don't like the idea of being so remote from an airport or a major transportation hub. Now, what are we supposed to do about those four things? Right? What are you supposed to do about those four things? The best we can to tell them why we love Iowa and then focus on the things that they tell us will be significant enough to overcome those objections that they might have to our location. And that's what we've been about the work of doing. And when we ask those questions, this is almost my last slide before we go on a break here. When we ask those questions, rank the following characteristics on the level of importance when considering Grinnell. The important enrollment considerations are listed here in order of importance to all survey respondents. An educational experience that is focused on personal advising. We do that very well at Grinnell. We do that very well, and thankfully we do. It was very important. Important enough that many students, in spite of their objection about the possibility of being a resident of Iowa, decided, ah, I'm going to reframe the way I was thinking about the location because I want that. And I can't find that at a lot of the other places that I'm thinking about. Remember the three circles, the, uh, the Venn diagram? It's got to be rare. It's got to be rare. If they can find that anywhere, why wouldn't they just go to a location they prefer, right? So access to experiential learning opportunities for all students, you don't get that at most colleges. You can have access to it, but it's not baked into the experience of every student the way that it is at Grinnell. That really sung to them. So did this sense of feeling that they belonged amongst the currently enrolled students, a program that's equally committed to intellectual and professional development, which we have in spades at Grinnell with the Center for Careers, Life, and Service and the integrated model of advising that we have at Grinnell, support for pursuing careers in which students are passionate, and then the opportunity to learn about the world around them. In this order, these were the things of greatest importance to the enrollment decision. So the way I talk to our staff about this is we have to figure out how to get students and their influencers' eyes up over the corn tassels. Because there's more to see, there's more to know, there's more to be excited about than there is to be concerned about. Now finally, before we go to break, I'm just going to uh, show you the importance that students associated with our no loan policy that would, we adopted right there during the pandemic. If you look at this long enough, you'll realize it was only not at all important to about 25% of students. 75% of students assigned some level, even if only slight, some level of importance to the no loan program, to their decision of applying or attending Grinnell. So it has made a significant difference to us, and I think partly explains a component of that recipe for how you get from 2011 at Grinnell to getting to 2024 at Grinnell. So this was important as well. 